Welcome back to Career Profiles. And this is part two of the Angelo Dundee story. I'm your host, Sean, joined as always by Johnston for the second part of Angelo Dundee's life story, his career profile. And it's another extraordinary tale. And this is why we've done two parts for a lot of the episodes during this season is because some of the stories are that great that we couldn't omiss them from our podcast and try to skim over anything so we've got some really great descriptions in this second part and we will be picking it up obviously from the part where we left it off in the last episode which is where he'd met Cassius Clay he'd took over his training and he'd started to get involved in in some relatively decent fights and we're up to the point now where we are coming towards the inevitable Clay Liston fight but Johnston before we do get into that of course, just a little note really on part two and what that's going to bring for everybody listening. I just love the story because Angelo is able to give us a great perspective from his point of view, from where he was in the ring, how he's able to analyse fighters, how he can find flaws in, in in their armoury and how he was able to implement his plan on, the, on those fighters as well as some great stories in between, of course. So yeah, enjoy really. It's, it's, there's not going to be a huge amount of fight descriptions in this. We're going to direct you to several other episodes that we've done because we don't want to be always retelling these stories. Uh, so we briefly do break some of them down. But yeah, it's great just having that perspective away from what we see from a fighter and having it from a trainer. We do bring that in sometimes in our career profiles, of course. But this is predominantly Angelo's point of view, which is great. Now, we're going to begin part two of Angelo Dundee's career profile with the inevitable Clay Liston fight, which was finally arranged for February the 25th, 1964, at the convention centre in Miami. Now, we did go through all the shenanigans that Clay went through to get Liston to accept a world title challenge. So, if you want to hear more of those shenanigans, please go back and listen to the tale of Cassius Clay and Sonny Liston. Now, Angelo recalled the moment after Liston destroyed Floyd Patterson for a second time, a fight that Clay was in attendance for and made his voice known. And Angelo said, Liston, who had heard all the shouting, now went over to Cassius. And in a less menacing voice than normal, he said, Clay, don't get hurt now, little boy. We're going to make a lot of money. And then he added, I'm going to beat you like I'm your daddy, before turning away and heading for the dressing room. The Liston fight also saw the emergence of Drew Bondini Brown, something that Angelo wasn't best pleased with, and he recalled, I remember one day Cassius coming up to me in the gym and saying, Ange, I'm bringing Drew Brown down from New York. Now I had heard about him from my sources in New York, who said he was some sort of nut, always talking in otherworldly tongues about such things as the sun, the moon and black satellites, as if he were possessed by some alien spirits. So I said to Cassius, For God's sake, don't do that. He'll drive me nuts and run everyone, especially the newspapermen, out of the room. Don't worry, Cassius said. I'll take care of him. Well, Cassius kept his word and kept his new addition away from Angelo. Years later, though, Angelo did admit Brown turned out to be a positive addition, working toward the same end as we all were winning and he proved to be a great plus for Cassius who believed Bundini charged my batteries. Yeah Bundini also invented the famous line float like a butterfly sting like a bee although Angelo explained I always thought butterflies flittered not floated. It was a line that would earn him a spot in boxing's Bartlett alongside such memorable quotes as Bob Fitzsimmons is the bigger they are the harder they fall or Joe Gans is bringing home the bacon. Joe Lewis is, he can run but he can't hide. And Kid McCoy is, I'm the real McCoy. That line was Bandini's and nobody else's. But it would become Cassius's as he practiced saying it time after time. Committing to it in his memory. With the fight signed, Angelo and Cassius got down to preparing for the Liston fight by watching several films of Liston's previous fights. Angelo then crafted a game plan, which he described in fascinating detail. He said certain people beat certain people. Certain styles trump others. I knew Cassius would kick 
the hell out of Liston. So together we identified several flaws in his style. The most notable of which was that boxers and at, at slipping punches and using the whole ring frustrated him. Eddie Machen, a quick scientific boxer, had gone 12 rounds against him and come within a couple of points of beating him. And the one loss on his record had been inflicted by a little-known journeyman named Marty Marshall, a defensive-minded fighter who employed lateral movement. Not only had Marshall beaten Liston, but he had lasted 10 full rounds in their return bout. I thought that Cassius was the master of lateral movement, and if he could keep away until Liston depleted what had been a limited supply of energy, he could beat him. In order to do this, I came up with a strategy only a Cassius Clay with exceptional speed and extraordinary reflexes could carry out, something I called surround the jab. Now, Angelo goes on to explain more by this, and he says, By this, I meant Cassius should continually go to his left away from Liston's wall-breaking jab, making him reach, frustrating him, and, as a consequence, tiring him. You know a frustrated fighter loses the snap out of his punches. Everything Liston did came off that jab. It was a timing thing. If he hit you with that sucker, everything went in sequence. Boom, he'd nail you with it. And if you were in front of it, you'd be destroyed. So take it away from him. Surround it. Circle to your left away from it. He can't hurt what he can't reach. I didn't have to tell Cassie as much. I just kept reminding him. You're quicker. You're smarter. You're not going to take his shots. Don't trade with him. Don't try to fight him in close. Outside, in and out. Nail him. This went on for months and months before the fight. We were prepared for Liston. Clay was so prepared for Liston that he decided it was time to go back to playing those mind games with not only the heavyweight champ but with the press and the doctors. At the weigh-in on the morning of the fight, Clay appeared to go berserk. He hurled insults at Liston and lunged at him shouting, I'm ready to rumble now. His handlers had to restrain him. However, Angelo admitted he was told to hold him back with a wink-wink. It was all for show, a way of hyping the fight. But when Clay's pulse and blood pressure were checked, indicating that they were off the scale, the show was blown out of proportion when the commission's doctor offered the opinion that the fighter is scared to death. Ali testified years later, The truth of the matter is, I rehearsed and planned every move I made that day. Well, due to the doctor's opinion, the fight all of a sudden was in jeopardy of being cancelled, so Angelo acted quickly. I asked Ferdy, Ferdy Pachayo, that is the doctor, to come with me quickly. We raced off to Cassius's house, where to our amazement, we found the supposedly hysterical Cassius sitting on the front steps playing with a bunch of kids from the neighbourhood. Ferdy examined him right there and then, taking his pulse and temperature, and found him normal and in perfect condition to fight. Using my contacts with the press, I went inside and made calls to Jack Cuddy at the Associated Press and to Ed Pope at the Miami Herald to tell them Clay was fine. His blood pressure, now 50 over 40, better than fine. He was in good shape for the fight that night. This is a good time to bring in Dr. Ferdy Pacheo, who said I was lucky enough to observe the magic of Angelo Dundee, who was the chief corner man. He ordered us to work on various things. Louis Saria was the physical conditioner and massaged the boxer's tired arms and legs to get the blood working again. As the fight doctor, I took care of the rest of the small injuries. While we worked, Angelo talked. The fighter had to be able to hear Angelo because Angelo was giving him round-to-round -round battle instructions. A genius like Angelo can win a fight through his instructions or by the use of psychology. He has to be inside the fighter's head and a fighter has to execute his orders. Where Pacheo explained how important Angelo was to have in a fighter's corner, Dundee explained why Ferdy was so vital for him too and his fighters. He said in order to ease a hypochondriac to fighters, so some of them were hypochondriacs as he explained, 
and, and to ease their mind and get them back to boxing. I had them visit Dr. Ferdy Pacheo, a super fight fan I had gotten to know through Chris's Tuesday night fights. Angelo continued and said Ferdy would furnish each of the so-called sufferers with aspirins and other harmless medication, telling them they were now fine and, as a favour to me, never charged them for his services. I borrowed Ferdy's method of treatment by feeding my fighters aspirins before fights, always telling them they were pet pills and that when the pills kicked in, the fighter would be able to knock down walls. Then I would keep coming back and asking, do you feel it yet? Most did. Now into the first Liston fight, and before the bell sounded for the start of the first round, Angelo said that Liston stood in his corner, shuffling his feet like a bull, seeing a red cape the way he always did, and giving Cassius the evil eye. As Cassius would say later, man, he meant to kill me. But after just one round, Angelo was more confident than ever that his man would be the new world heavyweight champion, and he said, The bell ending the round sounded, and Liston stomped back to his corner, not even bothering to sit down. Clay had already won an important psychological victory by lasting the round. I knew then and there that we had Liston. Clay was on command for the first three rounds, even opening up a nasty cut under Liston's left eye, but near the end of the third, Clay had a problem with his eyes. They were stinging so badly that Clay begged Dundee to cut off his gloves and end the fight. But Angelo convinced him otherwise and he said, I told him, you can't fight without gloves, sit down. And he sent Bundini over to tell the referee that there was something on Liston's gloves. He never made it, getting halfway across the ring before getting flustered and coming back to the corner without having told the ref anything. So Angelo continued, he said, but the referee, Felix, sensing something resembling confusion in our corner, began to make his way over. Catching sight of Felix coming halfway across the ring, I shouted to Cassius to get up and half lifted him off the stool to show that he was all right. Seeing my guy get up, Felix stopped and went back to the position in a neutral corner. At the sound of the bell for round five, I put my hand on Cassius' back, propelled him out into the ring and shouted, This is for the big one, son, the World Championship. Now get the hell out of here and run. Who knows? Maybe the what-if history of boxing was written right there and then. Liston began finding his range on the blinded clay, who took a number of heavy blows as he retreated, improvising desperately while he waited for his sight to return. Somehow, he survived, and by the end of the round, his eyes were fine, all cleared up. Whether a stinging antiseptic had been spread on Liston's gloves between rounds, used on his cut, which had opened and got worse, or used to loosen his shoulder injury, we will never really know. But once Clay could see again, Liston's chances had just depleted, they'd gone. In the sixth round, Clay changed tactics and went toe-to-toe against the champion. At the end of the round, Liston told his corner that he had had enough and refused to come out for the seventh. Sonny Liston surrendered his title sitting on the stall that night, later blaming his damaged shoulder, and Cassius Clay was the world heavyweight champion. Angelo's fault. Angelo wasn't convinced that anything cynical was at play when his fighter got blinded during the fight, saying that the solution used on Liston's cut somehow must have got into Clay's eyes. Others believed it was something on Angelo's towel. And it got into Clay's eyes when he wiped it, wiped the sweat off his face. We'll never know. Angelo later confided in Clay after the fight, explaining that he was scared of his Muslim friends. And he said, I thought your guys were going to kill me. They thought I had done something to the water. To save himself, he drunk some of the water and rubbed it in his eyes to show them it was safe. Ferdy Pacheo was sitting with the group and he overheard they were saying that they were going to get Angelo after the fight. They'd already warned Angie before the fight. Nothing had better happened to Cassius. They gave Angelo an awful time. We have been through this historic boxing moment many times, using many different perspectives, including Angelo, and we did mention other fights in which Liston's opponents were also blinded by some sort of solution. Angelo recalled, Later, 
Much later, I was to hear that two of Liston's previous opponents, Zora Foley and Eddie Machen, had both complained of a burning sensation in their eyes during their fights with Liston. But we have never found a quote direct from Angelo that adds even more controversy. But we have now. When he said, Liston's behind-the-scenes manager, Blinky Palermo, was later to confide to my brother Chris that indeed, Liston had put something on his gloves. But I didn't know, or even suspect it at the time. All I knew was that my kid was blind in there. Of course, you can believe as a listener, whatever you want to believe with all the different stories, if there was foul play or not, we can never actually find any concrete enough evidence for this to be conclusive. Now, after Cassius Clay became the world heavyweight champion for the first time, a New York sports writer, Red Smith, bumped into Angelo and congratulated him. He then admitted, I didn't think Clay could do it. I was beginning to think that Liston was unbeatable. They all did, and Angelo responded, Come on, Red. I told about 40 newspaper guys six days ago how this fight would go. Who did Liston ever knock out? Albert Westfall and Cleveland Williams? That's all. Willie Besmanov was stopped on cuts. Forget about Patterson, he was psyched out. Liston was the toughest guy in the world, so he couldn't believe what happened to him. This kid's slapping him around. He thought he was going to have a picnic with this kid. But what he didn't realise was this kid had become a man. And it demoralised him. Boxing beat Liston. Boxing and Cassius Clay. Angelo told a different story in the aftermath of the first Clay Liston fight. And we didn't mention this in the legendary night. And it's a great story. He recalled that out in the parking lot, a strange scene was taking place. Lou Duva had brought both Rocky Marciano and Joe Lewis to the fight. Uh, they were standing next to his car watching Marci... Well, he was standing next to the car watching Marciano sprint across the parking lot. He said, what the hell are you doing, Rocky? Shouted Duva, puzzled at the sudden activity of the ex-champion. Didn't you hear that? Shouted back Marciano as he continued to run. Clay's going to get one million for his next fight. I'm coming back. And with that, Lewis said, stand back, Lou. I'm going to run too. Absolutely quality from Rocky and Joe Lewis. Brilliant stuff. So their next fight would be a return against Liston. But it was the next day that the new world heavyweight champion sprang a surprise to the critics at a press conference when he announced that he had joined the Nation of Islam. Then on the night of March 6th, during a radio broadcast from Chicago, Elijah Muhammad announced, This clay name has no divine meaning. I hope he will accept being called a better name. Muhammad Ali is what I will call him for as long as he believes in Allah and follows me. Clay, of course, accepted the name and became known from that point as Muhammad Ali. Angelo was asked by reporters if he had any concerns with Cassius changing his name to Muhammad Ali. Angelo was pretty clear in his response and he said, I didn't have to think twice about it. No, I'd tell them. Hey, my original name wasn't Angelo Dundee, so why should I care about him changing his name? I did, however, have one very small problem. You see, I had become fairly adept at rhyming Cassius Clay for Cassius's poems. How in the name of the poetry muse was I going to find a rhyme for Muhammad Ali? I mean, what rhymes with Ali? Other than that, I had no trouble with Muhammad's religion or name change. With Ali now publicly aligned with the Muslim community, many outsiders begin to observe those within his ever-growing entourage, and for some, Angelo being white was now a problem. And he addressed claims of racism in camp and his relationship with Ali, and said, The most troubling stories were those that referred to the fact that I was the only white guy in Ali's entourage, as if there was a black-white thing between Ali and me. We had this special thing, a unique blend, a chemistry. I never heard anything resembling a racist comment leave his mouth. He accepted me for what I was, his trainer and friend. Between the two of us, we never had anything but a wonderful time. There was never a black-white divide. And hey, I was working for Muhammad Ali, not the Muslims, and he was fine with me. 
in between the time of the two list and fights, the acting head of the Louisville syndicate, Bill Faversham, had a heart attack and the acting boss of the syndicate was taken ill, so the organisation decided that Angelo should take over as Ali's manager for a while. What that meant was, as Angelo described it, I would be doing virtually the same things I already had been doing, but that I would get a greater increase in my salary. He then explained, Here I must tell you that I like money as much as the next guy, but money wasn't the main reason I enjoyed working with Cassius Haifa for Mohammed. I liked Mohammed. I enjoyed working with him and I was proud of the job I had done. And it was for those for these reasons I had taken over the job of training him without a contract and with only a handshake, which I guess they knew was as good as the most binding contract in the world. Angelo was given a $20,000 bonus and a percentage cut of Ali's future earnings. However, when Ali returned from Africa, he actually employed Herbert Mohammed, the son of Elijah Mohammed, as his new manager. And Angelo, well, he held no grudges about this. It was Ali's choice. He said, I had no problems with the tra- change. In fact, Herbert told me he knew what kind of job I was doing and that I would be Ali's trainer forever. The transition was smooth. So the Ali Liston rematch was actually scheduled for November 16, 1964. However, the fight had to be rescheduled after Ali needed emergency surgery for a hernia. Now, moving away from Ali, Angelo, of course, had other fighters to manage. And on November 30th, 1964, he was with Willie Pastrano, who was making his second defence of the unified light heavyweight titles against London or Terry Downs, and it happened in Manchester. Now, the champ was actually down on the cards and on the verge of losing his titles when Angelo Dundee showed once again why he was one of the best trainers in the business. And he recalled, Coming back to the corner, he, as in Willie Pastrano, let out one giant sigh and lamented, Why has God forsaken me? Now, in full well it wasn't God, who had directed his activities the night before, I answered, God ain't going to help you tonight. You've got to do it on your own. Amused him in the puss and slapped him on the rump to propel him out of his corner at the bell. Angelo said, and with that, Willie lunged at me in an effort to hit me in retaliation, and I hollered, don't get mad at me. I ain't taking your title. There's the chump over there you should be mad at. He's taking your title, sucker, and you wouldn't know it. It worked. Willie came back to knock Downs down and out. Pastrano would eventually lose his title in his next and last professional fight on March the 30th, 1965 against the superb Jose Torres. No words from Angelo that night at Madison Square Garden could stop the Puerto Rican from stopping him in the ninth round. Now moving back to Ali, and we have been through the rematch with Liston on our Legendary Nights episode and in other formats, so we won't go through it all over again. However, we will use information from Angelo Dundee that we haven't used before. So, there was a little secret that we will let him reveal when he says, There was one thing that wasn't talked about, even mentioned, and in fact was kept from the press. Just two days before the fight, in Mohammed's last sparring session, Jimmy Ellis had bruised Mohammed's ribcage. When he told me, all I could think of saying was, that's good, now you'll know to stay out of clinches. But maybe, just maybe, knowing he couldn't take a chance of having Liston pound on his bruised ribcage was enough to inspire Mohammed to take action, and quickly. I don't know, but I think that may have had as much to do with the quick ending as anything else. So of course, Ali defends his title successfully against Liston in the rematch with the so-called phantom punch ending it in just one round. Cries of fix filled the air and the airwaves have never been laid to rest. So we will give you Angelo's perspective. Yeah, so these were his thoughts on whether the punch actually connected and if it was a fixed fight. So he said, oh yes, the punch did make contact. Ali hit Liston so quick the cameras couldn't take it. He hit him with a shot Liston didn't see. They're the ones that knock you out. You see, 
For Liston, that one punch brought back memories of the beating he took in the first fight. It demoralised him. So no, it wasn't a fix. People can say what they think. If they think the punch didn't land, I tell them they should have looked away. They shouldn't have looked away when it landed. They shouldn't have gone out for a hot dog. And despite Jimmy Cannon's comment that I saw it, it couldn't have crushed a grape. If you look at the punch in stop action, you can see Liston's head snap back. His leg comes up from the force of the blow and then you see him go down. It was that hard. Well, Floyd Patterson was Ali's next victim and Angelo described the beating that he took as sadistic humiliation in the, the, uh, of the popular ex-champion. It was an ugly fight to watch and one that did little to help Mohammed's popularity. In fact, his popularity went downhill even further after the man, after the man I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Con quote came out, which effectively brought white America on his back. Now, in the midst of all this, Ali did outpoint George Chavalo and then arrived in London to a hero's reception to face Henry Cooper in a rematch to defend his World Heavyweight title. Now, Ali went on to stop Cooper on cuts again, this time in the sixth round. But it wasn't the fight that Andre remembered the most. He actually recalled that the scene after the fight was not a pretty one. There were what Mohammed described as a, a few little title fights outside the rings, a little few little scuffs. But they were worse than that. They were spilling over onto the ring. Angelo explained, immediately after the fight was halted by referee George Smith, several groups of teddy boys jumped over benches and stormed the ring, screaming racial slurs. Ali just looked at the rowdy mob, one of whom cuffed him, saying later, I thought it was just someone offering me congratulations. Brian London was next at Earl's Court, and he went down after an Ali barrage of punches in the third round. Angelo remembered, a TV producer, Chet Forte, who had planned an entire wide world of sports show around the fight, shouted over the production line from New York to ringside. Does he look like he's going to get up? Joe Assetti, the production assistant, took one look at the inert form lying just above him and hollered back, while his tongue's hanging out of his mouth and he's drooling and his eyes are white. But other than that, he's all right. London was stopped in three. Next was the German southpaw, Karl Mildenberger, the first Ali had ever faced and the first left-hander ever to fight for the world heavyweight title. Angelo recalled, From the moment Ali walked to the centre of the ring and was met by a right jab, he had difficulty coping with Mildenberger. It wasn't until the middle rounds that Ali finally solved Mildenberger's style, going to his left instead of his right to evade his opponent's right-hand jabs. Pressing his attack rather than moving, Ali finally overcame Mildenberger and his style, knocking him out in the 12th round. Ali then rolled off three more victories, including dropping his five-step in-place tango manoeuvre, as Angelo called it, the move Ali later called the Ali Shuffle, against Cleveland Big Cat Williams. Ali knocked him out in three, and then came the What's My Name fight against Ernie Terrell, who was massacred for 15 brutal rounds. Sora Foley would be Ali's last defence of the heavyweight title before he was suspended from boxing. Yeah, Angelo described just how good Ali was at this point as we sort of rounded that off quite quickly because obviously go back and listen to Ali's career profile. But Angelo just describing what Ali, Clay Ali was like. He said, when he knocked out Foley, Mohammed looked like a million dollars because he was maturing. In other words, he was special in there. He had negated him. And Zora Foley was one heck of a fighter. He was a great counterpuncher and he couldn't counter my kid. Then on April 28, 1967, Muhammad Ali refused to be inducted into the US Army and was immediately stripped of his heavyweight title. Angelo reflected on this moment. He said Muhammad had had nine successful title defences, more than Liston, Patterson and Johansson put together and a number of defences surpassed only by Joe Lewis and Tommy Burns. He was 25 years old and just reaching his prime. 
but because he had refused to play his hero's role the way the public demanded, the boxing establishment, unable to see him beaten in the ring, decided to beat him out of the ring by taking his title away from him. We never saw the best days of Muhammad Ali. For Angelo, he felt that Ali was being picked on because of his affiliation with the Nation of Islam, that America was scared of the unknown and his fighter, who had become his friend, was targeted. When he was asked for his thoughts about Ali's refusal to be inducted, this is what he said. I could only answer that, like millions of other Americans. I didn't understand the whole Vietnam situation. All I knew was that American boys were being killed over there and we weren't even certain it was our fight. Now, don't get me wrong. I am as proud as anyone of being American and I would have accepted my own draft as I had once before in World War II. But I can't honestly say how I would have felt if my son Jimmy had been drafted. I thanked God he was too young and prayed he would never have to go to war. Angelo was gutted to lose his most prized asset and missed Ali's humour and practical jokes. He described about a time that they were staying at a Los Angeles hotel where they had connecting rooms and he said, he had this long cord which went through our adjoining bathroom and he would shake it to shake my blinds. All night long, I heard this strange noise and was scared to death. What the hell was going on, I thought. We were on the 12th floor and I'd looked down. Nothing there. All around, nothing. It was just Muhammad playing games on me. He then gave a befitting explanation of how he saw Ali amongst some of the excellent talent he had, saying... No matter how well I had done with my other fighters, I was known and perhaps would always be known as Muhammad's trainer. He was the spotlight that shone on whatever other talent I had. Sure, Willie Pastrano, Carmen Basilio, Louis Rodriguez and Ultimino Ramos were the stars, but Ali was the moon, you know what I mean? By this point in 1967, Angelo had a much smaller stable of fighters, Carmen Basilio had retired in 1961. Sugar Ramos was the featherweight world champion until he lost to the brilliant Vincente Salvador in 1964 after winning that title in 1963 in the fateful fight against Davy Moore. Now, for those that don't know, Moore actually passed away two days after the fight with whiplash to his brainstem after his neck struck the bottom rope. Ramos would go on to fight in the lightweight division but came up against one of the greatest in Carlos Ortiz and lose both title shots by knockout. Willie Pastrano, as we said, retired in 1965 and fell victim to drugs and booze. Angelo tried to help him in any way he could. He said that he would call me at all hours of the night, sometimes when he was hallucinating. Yeah, and he remembered that once he called me in the wee hours of the morning because he said there were things in the garden. Other times, it was other things. And then last it is Luis Rodriguez, who probably was Angelo's most prized asset in 1967, even though he was on the demise. Now, he was the former worldweight champion and had fought Emil Griffith three times from 1963 and 1964, losing two and actually winning one. However, Angelo was adamant that it should have been two wins for Rodriguez and only one for Griffith. We should probably mention that we missed off the great Rodriguez when uh, the li when listing the world champions that Angelo had at this at that point at the end of part one. I suppose the fact it was the same night that Moore died and it sort of, I suppose it's something that Angelo didn't really want to reflect on too much. But to round off his career, we will let Angelo explain his failed attempt at becoming his first two weight world champion, and he said in 1969. He challenged Nino Benvenuti for the title. For 10 rounds, Lewis moved, jabbed and boxed his way to a sizable lead. Benvenuti was one tough cat. Uh, although tried, had strength enough to throw one desperation Hail Mary shot to the jaw of an equally tired Rodriguez in the 11th and that was that. Lewis fought on for another three years, but he was never the same Lewis Rodriguez and retired in 1972. 
So Angelo needed some fresh blood and he found it at Randy's gym. And it was the sparring partner of Muhammad Ali. It was Jimmy Ellis. Although don't let Angelo catch us calling him a sparring partner. He actually concluded that, now I hate the word sparring partner. I hate them because my kids work with each other, help each other. They are not sparring partners per se, but really assistants. And well, the assistant Ellis, he uh, learned from his sparring sessions with Ali. And as Angelo put it, Jimmy Ellis was to prove that old boxing saying that yesterday's sparring partner is tomorrow's potential champion. Well, Angelo wasn't wrong. Jimmy was a light heavyweight who was added amongst the eight-man heavyweight box-off to determine the WBA champion. He explained what happened in his first three fights as a heavyweight, and he said, in his first bout as a fully-fledged heavyweight, Jimmy knocked out Leotis Martin and then followed that up four months later with the decision over Oscar Bonavina. In the finals of the tournament, he defeated Jerry Quarry. Three fights as a heavyweight, three wins and one world championship, at least that part of the world overseen by the WBA. Not bad for a heavyweight newcomer. The other world champion, Joe Frazier, had captured the New York State version six weeks before Ellis when he knocked out Buster Mathis in 11 rounds. So it was no surprise that the boxing world were now calling for just one champion, and a bout was scheduled for February 1970 at Madison Square Garden. Fraser was the overwhelming favourite, but Angelo felt that Ellis could beat him, and he admitted, I thought that Jimmy's style was perfect for Fraser. Joe was made for Jimmy, but then again, I remember once thinking that the Titanic was faster than the iceberg. For two rounds, it looked like I was the one who might have had the crystal ball, as Jimmy outboxed, outmoved and outmaneuvered Joe. Then, in the third, Joe unloaded that left hook of his and Jimmy staggered backward, halfway across the ring and into the ropes. He momentarily recovered, but the fight was over, right then and there. Angelo had a decision to make when Ellis returned to the corner after being knocked down twice by Fraser and he'd give his explanation as to why he ended up stopping the fight and he said, the ref, believing he, as in Jimmy, was fine, would have allowed the fight to go on. However, I didn't think Jimmy was fine. Angelo said that he told me in the corner, geez, Angie, I was a little dazed, but I'm fine. I was only put down once. Well, that did it. Hell, if the kid didn't know how many times he had been knocked down, why should I break the news to him? So I told him, Jimmy, you were knocked down twice, but you only remember once, and that's why I'm stopping the fight. <laughs> well with his rights. Well, by the summer of 1970, Muhammad Ali finally had his license reinstated when it was ruled that religious beliefs could be grounds for conscientious objection. In August, it was announced that Ali would box in Atlanta, Georgia, which had a black senator um, and he took on Jerry Quarry. So obviously the black senator helped for him to fight there because many states didn't want Ali to fight in their states. So Muhammad Ali's 43 months out of the ring had cost him dearly, as he now had to work his way into contention for a world title again. Now, Angelo described what he saw in Ali's performance that night in Georgia against Jerry Quarry. He said, unable to renew his unrenewable youth, Ali's skills had declined during that enforced layoff. You could see it from the opening bell. Little things, but things that nevertheless told me he was a little bit rusty and no longer the Ali of old. His timing was off. His jabs and uppercuts weren't there. He had openings that he saw but he could capitalise on and he couldn't quite ball the trigger. And by the end of the third, he was bordering on exhaustion. Still, two right hands that inflicted a deep gash over Quarry's left eye, a gash that went right down to the bone, causing the fight to be stopped at the end of the third. Despite reporters at ringside falling all over themselves, writing that Ali was back, I knew he would need a lot more work before he faced Joe Frazier. After the quarry fight, Ali was given his boxing license in most states now, and that also included New York after some sort of hearing he had to go to, but eventually they gave it to him. This then set up a fight against Oscar Bonavina, where he became the first to stop him in the 15th and final round, resulting in another shot 
of the heavyweight title held by the superb Joe Frazier. However, Angelo had his concerns. His gut was telling him that he wasn't ready yet, and he recalled, Looking at the two fights, I thought he could once again be the Clay Ali of old, the super talented boxer who had defied description, the one with the specialised intelligence and radar-like moves no heavyweight ever had. But I wondered if the hinted at March date, just three months after his bruising fight against Bonavina, would give us enough time to rejuvenate those once great talents, diminished in part by time and inactivity, talents he would need to beat Fraser. I would have liked more time to hone those skills and, if possible, make the new Ali as close as possible to the old Ali. However, it was too late to back out now, with millions on the table for a fight at Madison Square Garden and the boxing world eagerly waiting in anticipation for these two combatants to tango. It was going to happen, whether Angelo liked it or not. The timing of the fight wasn't his only worry. It was Ali's vicious words aimed at Fraser that was also a cause for concern, and he explained why. He said Ali continued to salt his barbs with words like ignorant, dumb, ugly, and worst of all, Uncle Tom when referring to Fraser. To Ali, they were only words, his psych job to gain a mental edge. But to Fraser, they were more than a head game. They were personal and even though hurt by what I thought were some of Ali's below-the-belt comments, Joe wouldn't take the bait. His only response was to call Ali a phony and a clown. Well, Fraser refused to get involved in the war of words. He was more interested in the war in the ring. As Angelo put it, instead of returning Ali's jive, he turned his intense hurt inward, taking it out on the heavy bag, and on his sparring partners and vowing to do the same to Ali between what he called the four squares on March 8th. So, not only was Ali still a bit ring rusty and never likely to get back to that old self of his when he was clay and when he changed his name after, he was also pissing off a prime Joe Frazier and that, ladies and gentlemen, was a recipe for disaster and Angelo Dundee knew it. They prepared as best they could and all felt confident, of course, and Ali probably too confident. Now, we've gone through this absolute epic encounter in our towel of Ali and Fraser, and the fight of the century. So, we're not going to go through it in too much detail. We're just going to use moments from Andrew's perspective again. So, at the end of the eighth round, so the fight's going on, and at the end of the eighth round, this was one moment that didn't please Dundee. And he recalled, Ali came back to his corner after the round. And I gave him a what for, telling him to quit fooling around. And fooling himself as well. He couldn't see that every time he invited Frazier to come in and punch, Frazier did just that. And Ali wasn't doing much to respond. For crying out loud, I shouted, stop playing. Do you want to blow this fight? Do you want to blow everything? You're giving away Rands and letting him build not only a lead, but also his confidence. Well, that rally cry worked and Ali took the knife and looked in control. But not for long. After the 11th, Ali slumped on his stall and Angelo, again, he recalled this time, there were no split gloves to save him, only advice. I tried, shouting into his ear to get back on your toes, to get off the ropes, to use your jab, to do anything to turn the tide of battle, all the while massaging his legs to bring them back to life. However, Fraser was able to dig that bit deeper, those hateful words in the build-up ringing in his ears louder now than ever. He had the edge going into the 15th and last round. Ali was caught with a long left hook to the head and he went down for the count of three. Many would have been flattened, but Ali demonstrated his underrated chin and amazing recovery skills to survive and hear the final bell. The verdict was unanimous in favour of Joe Frazier, who emerged as the worthy winner and held on to his world heavyweight titles. A first defeat for Ali was a bitter pill to swallow, but he was made of sterner stuff than that. Angelo explained it like only he could when he said, the ability to take the bitter with the sweet defeat with victory or basically how they react to adversity is an essential element in the psychological makeup of fighters. 
Many fighters have been ruined by one setback. They become so accustomed to winning that when they meet defeat, they don't know how to accept it. Instead of trying to learn from it, they lose confidence in themselves. Ali licked his wounds and got back to it. In fact, Angelo said it was the very next day that he was already able to identify where he went wrong. He admitted to lacking in training, believing in his own hype and thinking that talent alone was enough. He knew the hard work and graft by running those extra miles and staying extra hours in the gym. That would make the difference next time. Where Ali might have lacked in his dedication to work harder in preparation for Fraser, he did not lack in confidence. He certainly didn't and Ali's next fight against Jimmy Ellis gave Angelo a difficult decision to make and he clarified why he made the one he did. He said, with Mohammed, I was the trainer, only part of the team. With Jimmy, I was the team. Jimmy paid one third of his purse for my services and he was entitled to them. So I went to Mohammed and explained my di- dilemma. And Mohammed understood and respected my decision to work in Jimmy's corner that night. So for only the second time in Mohammed Ali's career, Angelo wasn't in the corner. Obviously, the first was his debut. And in this Ellis fight. But he was 100% committed to Jimmy Ellis. Although the seasoned trainer summed up the fight in a nutshell. He said, I didn't let my personal feelings for Mohammed interfere one little bit work in Jimmy's corner. Know what? It really didn't matter. Ali was too good, too strong and too much for Jimmy. With only 15 seconds left in the fight, the referee st- stepped in and stopped it, awarding the fight and the NABF belt to Hamid. After the fight, the two boyhood friends from Louisville were reunited. As for me, I was back in Hamid's corner for the next fight and every fight thereafter throughout his career. After beating Ellis, Ali embarked on a 10-fight sequence in 23 months spell fighting in five countries meeting and beating Buster Mathis, Mark Foster Joe Bugner, Bob Foster and Al Blue Lewis as well as repeating his earlier wins over Jerry Quarry Floyd Patterson and George Chavano. Angelo described this run of victories he said measured against the yardstick of his performances before his exile there were some flashes of the Muhammad Ali of old, some pockets of the old brilliance. But more often than not, he looked like he was going through the motions without the emotions, as if on autopilot, content merely just on winning. He seemed to be missing that old piss and vigour and that certain something that gave him his psychological edge. Then came Ken Norton, and as Angelo thought, it would not be easy. Kenny was a finely tuned, finely sculpted fighter, he said. Stealing a page from Mohammed's book, I labelled him Hopalon Cassidy because with that lurching, herky-jerky, splay-footed movement of his, you just couldn't time him. He promised to give Mohammed as much trouble style-wise as Joe Fraser had given my guy trouble, physical-wise. But Mohammed, with his usual, unshakable self-assurance, thought he could handle Norton and didn't put He's all into training. It would prove to be a mistake that would cost Muhammad. His assessment, which is very rarely wrong, was accurate. Not only did Ali lose by a split decision, he sustained a terrible and almost career-ending broken jaw. Please do check out our career profile on Muhammad Ali for more details of this fight and the other fights with Norton. Ali did recuperate at his new training camp in Deer Lake in Pennsylvania, and celebrities came in their droves, and Angelo remembered. There was Elvis, who fell asleep in one of the guest houses and never left the building, nobody knowing where he was, and Tom Joes, and Chris Christopherson, and Mike Douglas, and Richard Harris, and Pierre Salinger, who came to get a pair of gloves signed for President John F. Kennedy, and Howard Cassell, and many, many more. It was an endless parade. Always with his trainer hat on, Angelo admitted, the only thing I didn't like about the camp was the fact that Mohammed was a captive there. People would come at six in the morning and stay all day. Mohammed was such a great host. He'd want to entertain people and it would take him away from his training. 
That's the part I didn't like. But Angelo didn't need to worry, because as he put it, when Ali wasn't entertaining, he was training. Angelo said he would be hiking up hills, chopping wood and sparring with his separates, including Larry Holmes, Jimmy Ellis, uh, Alonzo Johnson, Gene Wells, and the best of all, his brother, Rutman, who uh, wouldn't back off, saying, shit, opponent's not going to be taking, or not going to be backing off, so I won't. And as usual, Ali took it easy on him. Didn't try to beat him, working mainly on his defence, and that was the words of Angelo. But when Ali was training, he was always, as Angelo put it, ever the mischief maker. He decided the type of antics he had his entourage do and keep him entertained before making them fight each other in a boxing match. <laughs> it was always a playful way. It wasn't like a serious thing. To crafting ways of making fools out of some of them. Um, Angelo actually recalled that Ali implicitly had Gene Kilroy who could do a perfect imitation of Hal Cassell. Uh, and he had him call Bandini Brown over at the kitchen from the training quarters, pretending to be Cassell. Kilroy actually asked Bandini, what does Drew Bandini Brown do? And Bandini answered, Cassell with his stock. There are good witch doctors and bad witch doctors. And which are you? The Cosellian voice asked. I'm the good witch doctor. The voice went on. And what does Angelo Dundee do? He comes in a couple of days before a fight, but I handle all the training, boasted Bundini. Thank you, said Cassell Kilroy, and hung up. And with that, within seconds, Bundini Brown come running into the gym to tell Ali and others, all hiding behind their smiles, that Howard Cassell had just called and that he had told him that Angelo was here all the time and that he was a good guy. It was all like that. A picnic every day with Ali. Ali went on to win the rematch against Norton six months later, the immediate rematch, but his hands were beginning to give way. Angelo explained that a boxer's hands are the tools of his trade. Their importance cannot be overemphasized. Several fighters, like former middleweight champ Al Hostak, lost fights because of brittle hands. Now, after 20 years of wear and tear, of hitting bags, sparring partners and opponents, Muhammad Ali's hands look like rock pulverised by constant pounding. They had become fragile. He had developed calcium deposits on his hands and they were hurting him more than any opponent's punches. Even with his hands in a delicate situation, the Joe Fraser rematch was made, a fight that would determine the number one contender for the heavyweight title now held by George Foreman after he pulverised Fraser in brutal fashion. Angelo was now eager to resolve the issue with Ali's hands, so he turned to Gene Kilroy, who had NFL connections. Apparently, as Angelo described it, Ali had him bring in a hot wax applicator that he used every day, and I had him hitting the light bag barehanded as therapy, which he did over and over again until he scraped the skin off his knuckles. Then he'd tear the dead skin off his knuckles and after resting his hands for a week to let them heal, he'd go back at it again, toughening up his hands. Still, Ali suffered. But while he suffered the excruciating pain in silence, it was evident that something was wrong. Watching him in the ring with his sparring partners, Bundini was so moved by Ali's reluctance to block his sparring partner's punches, he cried out, Champ, if there's something wrong, Let's leave boxing. Leave boxing. They didn't. And even when discussions of the Fraser rematch being scrapped were quickly derailed due to how fast tickets were sold, Ali, well, he just couldn't back out now. And the publicist Harold Comrade told Ali, the garden's sold out and you can't beg, borrow or steal a ticket. Nobody's going to find anything wrong with the fighters at this late stage. Two legs missing might help, otherwise good luck. The second fight wasn't as bad as Angelo made out in his what he says here. Uh, but it was his view that he said, unfortunately the fight itself was not exciting as as their TV skirmish, which is a uh, check out our tale of uh, Ali and Frazier would have a TV fight. In fact, he said, 
you could almost say it bordered on the dull side, lacking all the excitement and brilliance of their first match. I don't think it was that bad, but that's his opinion. So Ali eventually outpointed the former heavyweight champion over 12 rounds, much to the annoyance of Team Frazier, who argued of persistent holding that the ref failed to spot. Either way, Ali and Angelo were now poised to challenge for the world title once again against the formidable George Foreman. Again, we've been through all this and how the fight was put on, uh, put together in the Muhammad Ali career profile and the towel of Ali Foreman and in Don King's Dark Side of Boxing episodes. Go and have a listen to those. But in short, Mr. Slippery, Don King managed to get Foreman to sign a contract, even though he had no money, but he was able to secure a venue in a very obscure region of Africa under the promotional banner of Video Techniques. So the rumble in the jungle, as we know it, was signed and sealed to take place in Zaire. Well, there would be delays, there would be concerts, endless stories uh, we've already told. But again, we will go through this in the eyes of Angelo Dundee only. And he said that there was a doubt and nervous energy to Ali before the fight. And the man himself did confirm this. But that doubtful feeling that Ali called it, it helped him prepare harder than he had ever prepared before. The only other fighter he had trained for like this was, it, of course, when he was preparing for the fight against Sunny Liston, Fullman's hero. Angelo said, Mohammed trained as he had never trained before, running up and down the mountain trails surrounding his Deer Lake camp, putting in extra time working the bags, skipping rope, sparring, and thinking of little else than Foreman. Foreman, and more Foreman, morning, noon, and night, 24-7. Angelo carefully selected three sparring partners to prepare his fighter, he chose Roy Williams, a rugged banger with heavy hands who was an inch or so taller than Ali. Larry Holmes, another tall heavyweight who could also bang but had great boxing skills as well. And Bossman Jones, who had been Foreman's sparring partner. And Bossman was the perfect starting point. They could pick his brains, and they did. He told the team, George is the first person I have been in the ring with. I know, can kill you. He described his anywhere punch, a punch foreman ain't aiming anywhere, but anywhere it lands, it breaks something inside you, a muscle, a bone, a finger, a shoulder, a rib. He told them, it's a punch that starts out being a hook, but ends up a slider. Angelo then went through the process of their preparation for the powerhouse world champion, and he said, as soon as Bossman told us what George was doing in training and how he was preparing, we went back to watch Foreman's previous fights to dissect his past performances frame by frame, including those in the Olympics and against Fraser and Norton. I was convinced that the sum of all his parts was less than whole. So, knowing he had not gone more than four rounds in over three years and had only fought five total rounds over the last 22 months, we paid particular attention to the three fights in which he had gone the distance for telltale signs about his stamina. And what did we see, he said. In George's first fight with Giorgio Peralta, his trainer manager, Dick Sadler, had told him that the ninth round was the last round. When George came back to his corner after the bell ended the ninth and held out his gloves to cut him off, Sadler then told him that there was one more round to go. To hear Jewel tell it later, he nearly fainted, so he was struggling. We knew that if we could take George past the third round, his parachute wouldn't open, as Ali put it. Now, with the game plan in mind, and as Angelo said, after two full months of preparations of watching and re-watching films, training hard and thinking of nothing but foreman, morning, noon and night, we were as ready as we were ever going to be. The next important part of the process was to go to Zaire to acclimate Ali with the local food, the temperature and the people and to make him as comfortable in Zaire as he had been in Deer Lake. Well, Ali was able to adapt to about any type of surroundings. Uh, he was like a messiah out there and Angelo just remembered that Ali went to work converting the people of Zaire into Ali fans. He would mingle with the crowds of onlookers, 
run with them and lead choruses of Ale Mumbai, which loosely translated, I found out, in Swahili as Ali kill him. Ali was like a church choir master leading his throng of worshippers as they continually shouted his name and chorused their chant of Ali Bumbai. But there were serious training hours put in as well. Ali once said that the fight is won or lost far away from the witnesses behind the lines out there on the road, long before I danced under those lights. He ran himself into exhaustion, sometimes at 4am in the morning, to accustom himself to the time of the fight, which was the early hours of the morning. Interestingly, when we did do the tale of Ali Foreman, we actually didn't mention that each fighter was being spied on by the other because they shared the same training facilities. Although Ali would only do basic training exercises in front of the public and prying eyes, like Archie Moore and Dick Sadler, who were there every day. Moore even took blatant notes. However, Ali was smart and only did his real work in private in the back room. Angelo admitted to being a sneaky little sod when he said, My reconnaissance was simple. All I had to do after Ali had finished his workout and turned the gym over to George was to go to the dressing room window, which overlooked the gym, pull back the drapes and use a telescopic lens borrowed from Ali's official photographer, Howard Bingham, sneak a peek to see what I could see. And what I saw was George, back turned as if he knew someone was watching, banging away on the heavy bag with thunderous punches, leaving huge dents in the lower portion of the bag. After punching the bejeevers out of the bag, he sparred with his sparring partners, six of them compared to our three, most of whom had sparred with Ali at one time or another, fighting four minute rounds instead of three, with only half a minute's rest in between. Obviously, as Bundy Brown said, they ain't planning for him to get tired. Ali was working 19 rounds each day, three rounds on the speed bag, four skipping rope, three on the heavy bag and nine three-minute rounds of boxing with his three sparring partners. Then the fight was postponed due to a cut that Foreman had suffered in a sparring session. Fearing that if Foreman would leave the country and never come back, Ali sent a message via the press to President Mobutu. And in that message, Ali being Ali, great message, but this is what he said. He said, I appeal to the president not to let anybody connected with this fight out of the country. Be careful. George might sneak out. Watch the airports. Watch the train stations. Watch the elephant trails. Send boats to patrol the rivers. Check all the luggage big enough for a big man to crawl into. Do whatever you have to do, Mr. President. And don't let George leave the country. He'll never come back if you let him out. Then he added a a word from the sponsor. Because he knows I can't lose. The plan worked though. And Foreman stayed for the 36 day delay. And was unable to train or spar for 10 of those. All the while Ali and Angelo worked on their game plan even further. It wasn't easy for many, including Angelo himself, who found it difficult managing to use his spare time. That was until he bumped into some Italian friends who owned an Italian restaurant. He described it as heaven, or at least a little bit of Italian heaven in the hellish Zaire. When on the day of the fight, Angelo and matchmaker Bobby Goodman had to take a 40-minute bus ride to the stadium so they could check on the ring, and it was a good job they did. The ropes were slack and the canvas was actually on a slant. So they actually tightened the ropes and levelled out the canvas to make it fight ready. It took a few hours, but it got done. But between Angelo and Bobby and a few workers at the stadium, finally it was done and they worked through torrential rainstorm while doing it. So into the fight and Angelo remembered the first round as Ali's popping off his jab and keeping away the plan they'd worked on all this time. But then in the second, Foreman cut off the ring and was landing heavy-handed clubbing blows. Angelo shouted, Move, Ali, move! But he just looked down at me and went back to cover it up. Angelo was baffled and a little worried, but his mind was put at ease when between rounds two and three, Ali told his corner, I know what I'm doing. He knew that George is cutting the ring off 
and making him move those extra steps would tire him out in later rounds and had decided to change strategy. Now, I've always been of the mind that the trainer is supposed to be the boss, that his directions are to be followed to the letter. But Muhammad Ali was different. He always had a mind of his own, a ring intelligence second to none. And now he decided to change the rules of engagement, change the equation and make his defence his offence. In the process, making George work and work some more with the aim of making George wear himself out. It went against all common sense, but it was working. Angelo said that Ali paid no heed to my instructions. Ali came out for the third and immediately went back to the ropes. Angelo said he was using his now legendary rope dope strategy, though I thought it was just the dope. I didn't have anything to do with it. It was all Ali's idea. His plan was working to a treat and the ropes had gone back to being slack, but it helped him evade most of them menacing blows. Angelo recalled, believing that the ropes, now limp from the tropical heat, should be tightened to enable Ali to, as he had been hollering, get off the ropes, Bundini jumped up on the apron and made as if ready to do so. But I grabbed him before he could leave the corner, shouting, no, no, for Christ's sake, don't, leave them alone. I figured, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And Ali's strategy of staying on the ropes was working fine, thank you. And no thank you, Bundini. Well, after four rounds, Ali knew he had a badly fatigued foreman. But instead of going for the kill, he played with him for a few more extra rounds to the delight of the crowd. As the bell for the eighth round sounded, Angelo shouted, He's out of gas. Take him out of there. He's ready to go. He was, and Ali did the business. Describing it in his way, he said, The punch I knocked him out with, if I'd have knocked him down in the first round, he would have got up. But by the time I got him, he was so exhausted that to pull himself up off the canvas was just too much. Muhammad Ali had recaptured the world heavyweight title, only the second to do it, the first, Floyd Patterson. Angelo felt smug. After all, he was one of very few men to say that Ali would win, by knockout no less, although his prediction was only a couple of rounds out. Not that it mattered, he got it right. And Ali fought and won three times after that. Chuck Webner was one guy, which we again check out his uh, Dark Side of Boxing episode. We do go into great detail on that fight. Ron Lyle and Joe Bugner, they were the three fights after Foreman. And then he announced his retirement. But Angelo remembered the moment that he changed his mind. And he said, after the Bugner fight, Ali was laying on his bed back at the hotel watching films of the second fight with Joe Frazier. Suddenly, he jumped up and hollered, get me Joe Frazier. His brief retirement was over. Now, it was on to Menina. So the Ali Frazier free fight took place on October the 1st, 1975 in Cuzon City, six miles outside Manila. Now we've been through this fight. There's well, loads of these. Uh, we have the tale of uh, Ali and Frazier. So we'll keep it as brief as we can. So their third fight was like three fights in one. So the early rounds belonged to Ali. He outfoxed Frazier, landing the sharp punches and staggered the challenger several times. Frazier, who kept coming forward throughout, took the middle rounds, turning the tide. Now Ali was tiring, and Frazier rocked him with some solid blows. Angelo admitted as they approached the championship rounds. For the first time in the fight, Mohammed sat on his stool as I searched for the right words to tell him. We blew those rounds. You don't rest on the ropes against Joe Frazier. You're taking a licking. Throughout the championship rounds, Angelo could only find rally cries of go get him when he felt that Fraser had tired and lost the pop in his punches, but every time the challenger would come back. In the end, Eddie Futch pulled out his man before the 15th and last round. Angelo summed up one of, if not the greatest ever, heavyweight fight in history when he said, It was a brutal fight, but like I told the press when it was over, both guys ran out of gas. Only my guy had an extra tank. Angelo then set up three easier fights for Ali after that brutal battle with Fraser. He made three defences against Jean-Pierre Koopman, 
Jimmy Young, who would go on to outpoint George Foreman a year later, and then Richard Dunn, before Ali demanded the third Ken Norton fight. He wanted to make it two wins out of three, like he had done against Fraser. Make it clear who the better man was. A week before the fight, Angelo and Ali were at Madison Square Garden, who had thrown a gala to honour the Olympic champions of 1976. And Jim Kilroy brought a young man who had won a gold medal, and that man was Ray Leonard, and he brought him over to sit him next to a certain Muhammad Ali. Angelo recalled, as Ray sat there like a starstruck 12-year-old with saucer cup eyes looking at his idol, Muhammad turned to him and said, You're good, you're fast, and you're going to be like me. Then he added, and if you ever go pro, you need pros around you. Yeah, Angelo continued with his story. He said, It was at that moment that Kilroy introduced me to Leonard with a, Here's the guy who made Muhammad Ali, Angelo Dundee. And Ali, never far from the conversation, chimed in with, Yeah, Angelo Dundee. If you ever go pro, he's the guy for you. He's a good guy, loyal, dedicated and honest. And that was that at least for that moment. So a week on and Ali was back in the ring with Norton and once again their fight was close and Angelo recalled this fight. He said, knowing how close the fight was, I exalted Ali. You've got three more minutes. Fight like hell. We need this round. It's the last round. But over in Ali's corner, believing that they had the fight in the bag, his manager, Bob Byron, told his fighter to stay away. This strategy of staying away always had cost other fighters before and after. Like Joe Frazier, like Jersey Joe Walcott in his first fight with Joe Lewis and Oscar De La Hoya against Felix Trinidad later. Now it was to cost Norton as he become strangely inactive while Ali closed the show, winning the round decisively. That one round proved to be the difference. Although Ali felt he had lost the fight, it was that last round won by Ali that actually picked Norton's pocket, not the judges. Incredible. There you go. It was just a tricky fight, wasn't he? For Ali for Norton. It was just it was just a, a puzzle, really. He just about worked out. So during 1976 and 77, Ray Leonard, who retired after the Olympics, decided to make a comeback and he wanted to become professional. Uh, and because he was hot property, he was given many offers by many different people. So we have gone through the offers, his association with lawyer Mark, Mike Trainer, and the invention of the Ray Leonard Incorporated in his career profile of Sugar Ray Leonard. So if you want more insight into that, then do go back and have a listen to that episode. But to make a long story short, Mike Trainer hired a public relations man called Charlie Brockman, a.k.a. Mr. Sports. With Leonard's team building, they now needed a trainer slash manager. And it was Charlie who came up with the idea of interviewing three trainers they identified as the best in the business. And that was Eddie Futch, Gil Clancy and Angelo Dundee. Charlie was tasked with the role of conducting the interviews and Angelo says it went something like this. Sugar Ray Leonard is considering going professional and then he rattled off a series of questions like where would he train? Where would his home base be? What opponent should he fight first? Could you help publicise Ray? I must have given the right answers for somehow, some way, Brockman's recommendation as to who, as he put it, could do the most good for Sugar Ray, both in and out of the ring, was, ta-da, me, Angelo Dundee. Mike Trainer called and offered Angelo the job and then sent a copy of a proposed six-year contract to act as Ray's personal representative, boxing advisor and manager. Angelo said, I was to receive 15% of Leonard's boxing earnings. Satisfied with the terms, I flew to Washington to sign the contract. Trainer personally picked me up at the airport and took me immediately to a press conference to announce my signing on as Sugar Ray's manager. Angelo immediately pulled Ray into his 5th Street gym in Miami and studied this amazing young talent and he gave a fascinating insight into how he did this. He said, How do I evaluate a boxer's skills in a gym situation? I watch him spar. 
and then take notes, normally on the back of any handy old envelope or piece of paper available, breaking down a fighter's style the way an English teacher would a sentence. My notes usually include observations on the boxer's hand movement, ability to slide, balance, jab, and so on. Angelo liked what he saw, and he said with Ray there were very few such notes. From what I saw, he had an awful lot to offer. Great balance, lightning reflexes, and a big punch. Angelo gave us further insight into what he did and how he was to turn him, as in obviously Leonard, from an amateur into a professional. He said, my first job was to build up his stamina. After stamina building exercises, Ray underwent long sessions of sparring and shadow boxing. I hardly touched his style. He was near perfect. What I did was tweak it a little, teaching him to get down on his punches a little more so that when he punched rather than slapped, as well as showing him angles and other subtleties that would allow him to translate those skills into professional success. Now, while Angelo worked with a young Ray Leonard, set to make his professional debut, he, of course, continued to work with the heavyweight champion, Muhammad Ali, who picked up his 44th professional win over Alfredo Evangelista. His next fight at Madison Square Garden, which would be his last as well at Madison Square Garden, was against the tough and heavy-hitting Ernie Shavers. After almost being knocked out in the second round, Ali managed to compose himself and take a healthy lead, and Angelo knew it, and he advised Ali to be careful, and that the fight was his if he didn't get knocked out. Maybe he was too careful going into a defensive cocoon and letting Shavers beat the bejeebas out of him with his sledgehammer shots, some of the hardest he had ever been hit with, blows that could have fallen trees, but not Ali. Almost from memory, Ali hung on, surviving the battering in rounds 13 and 14, only to come back and win the 15th big and the decision. But I had the feeling that some victories were harder than defeats, and that Ali was, to cop a line from someone or other, a victor by victory undone. After the Shavers fight, there was genuine concern for Ali's health. Angelo said, it was obvious to all, especially those close to him, that the floating butterfly, whose feet had barely touched the ground in his prime, was now a stationary sitting duck, absorbing punishment he never would have in his prime from the likes of Ernie Shavers. Ferdy Pacheo had left the corner, no longer able to watch Ali take punches. He shouldn't have had to. Gene Kilroy told Ali, You can beat everybody, but you can't beat Father Time and garden matchmaker Teddy Brenner told Ali the morning after the Shavers fight, Sooner or later, some kid that can't carry your jock is going to beat you. You're going to get hit. You're going to get hurt. You've proven everything that a great champion can possibly prove. You don't need this. Get out. He listened to none of the advice, still collecting excellent money against guys with less ability because people still wanted to see Ali fight. While Ali was still the world champion, his skills were diminishing, but Angelo was busy when not with Ali navigating his next young star along. By this point, the close of 1977, Ray Leonard had fought six times and won all six and knocked out four. It was Angelo that was carefully selecting his opponents and he gave us great insight into his matchmaking and he said, Matchmaking is not like spinning the wheel on Wheel of Fortune and coming up with a match slash opponent nor was it spoon-feeding him fighters with toe tags from the local cemetery, as many managers do to build up their fighters' early careers. No, you've got to make the right matches, matching your fighter with guys he can learn from, not only to increase your fighter's experience, but also so you can gauge what your fighter's got. Andrew explained why, why upping the levels of opponents is important. He said, by constantly raising the bar, on your fighter's training wheels, you increase the odds of his success and his chances of being up in competition. Raising the bar also gives you an opportunity to see how high his ceiling is. 
You've got to be very careful you don't overstep your kid's talent. Don't try before he's ready. This happens to a lot of fighters. Kids are called upon to show their talent before they're ready for the big time and they can't handle it. You've got to put your fighter in the best possible matches for him, ones he'll learn from. And needless to say, the less risky, the better. Leonard wouldn't move into his scheduled 10 rounders for another three fights. And it wasn't until the summer of 1978 that he went the full 10 round distance. But Angelo was impressed with his developments. With each passing fight, Ray began leaving his calling card for future greatness. His laser-like punches had clinical precision. His balance was such he could franchise it. His centre of gravity as near perfect as any fight I'd ever seen. And he could faint any opponent out of his jockstrap. Jumping back to Ali, he decided to do what he always done in the past. And that was to look for an easier opponent after a hard fight against Ernie Shavers. He chose an inexperienced pro with seven fights, a fellow gold medalist of Sugar Ray Leonard at the Rome Olympic Games. And that card was Leon Spinks. And check out our Dark Side of Boxing episode on Leon Neon Spinks. For more details on the build-up, the fight, the aftermath, the two fights with Ali. So the heavyweight and the people's champion, Muhammad Ali, fought. He just needed to show up and he would win this fight. But, well, Leon Spinks had other ideas. Angelo knew how tough this kid was, and he remembered. I had a kid named Lee Canalito fighting in St. Louis on the same card as Leon in Leon's hometown debut. Getting up at five in the morning of the fight to make sure Lee was doing his final road work, a chance to look out the hotel window and caught Leon getting out of a cab, kissing his lady friend of the evening, or morning, or whenever, goodbye, and then taking a swig out of a bottle. No glass, mind you, that would have wasted a step, just straight out of the bottle. That night, he went into the ring and cold-cocked his opponent, Pedro Agosto, in one round. Now that's tough. And that is the Leon Spinks we know. Ali was out of shape and hadn't trained enough to beat Spinks, who took the title away from Ali. Now he wanted to become a three-time world champion. This time, it was the reversal. Ali trained hard, while Spinks didn't, and Ali managed to recapture the world heavyweight title. Although, just the WBA version, because the WBC made that title vacant after Spinks accepted the rematch. Angelo described the second fight like this. The second Spinks fight was hardly fight of the century. Far from it. From a sweet science standpoint, it was sloppy. But it was beautifully sloppy. Wonderfully sloppy. Gorgeously sloppy. No showboating, no rope dopes no taunting. Just Muhammad getting in there and doing his number. It was vintage Ali. The morning after the Spinks fight, Ali called it a day and retired again. He had retired many times before, but this time it seemed different and Angelo believed him. So, they decided to go separate ways, and as he put it, jump ship. Yeah, Angelo felt privileged at this point. He he had uh, been in the corner for so many years and described his emotions of an an amazing, an emotional ride with Muhammad Ali, and he said, the Ali years, as my bride Helen called it, had finally come to an end. We had travelled many roads together on Ali's magic carpet. Faraway places like Zaire, Manila, Kuala Lumpur, Las Vegas, Tokyo, Munich, San Juan, New York and New Orleans. I was always in his corner, sometimes cajoling, sometimes suggesting and sometimes demanding things from him in both hard and easy fights. And it had always been a gas just to be around him. These were some of the best days of my life, exciting times that that would provide memories I would cherish forever. But now it was time for me to close the book on the Ali chapter and get on with my life. Well, so he thought, well, Angelo could now concentrate on his young star, who was now 13-0, just before Ali recaptured the heavyweight title against Spinks. So in August 1978, ABC actually offered Team Leonard 
uh, a televised fight against Tommy Earns. Now, while Angelo obviously just just now split with Ali, probably not as busy, was on holiday and he was uh, un unreachable on the phone. A guy called Dan Doyle, who was part of this Ray Leonard Incorporated team, actually agreed to a hundred thousand dollar fee for Sugar Ray Leonard, while Hearns, this was a fight was against Tommy Hearns, was guaranteed to make twelve and a half thousand. So that was the fight they were planning. But just before the contracts were signed and ABC were about to announce the fight, Angelo called. You obviously heard about it. He rushed to a phone and he called to make sure it wasn't happening. He called from his fishing trip in Florida Keys and he put a stop to it. He said, we can't fight Hearns. We're not ready for him. His main reason that both fighters will earn, his main reason for not having a fight was that both fighters will earn larger payday in a couple of years. He even predicted that a fight between the two hot shots would generate a hell of a lot more than 100,000, more like in his millions. Now, although Mike Trainer and some of those others within the team were not best pleased with the decision initially, history tells us he was right, and it was an excellent decision. Ray was matched with what Angelo called more than the usual suspects, instead matching him against the likes of Rafael Rodriguez, Dick Ackland, Floyd Mayweather Sr., Randy Shields, Johnny Gant, Fernand Makote and Aldolfo Verut, each a rung on Sugar Ray Leonard's ladder to the top. All tough fighters, they had a cumulative record of 171 wins in 208 fights for a winning percentage of 0.822 and each presented some sort of risk for Ray. But Ray, continuing to grow both professionally and personally with every fight, came through this welterweight baptismal of firepower with flying colours winning all seven, four of them by knockout. But not all was fine and dandy in the Leonard camp, and Angelo explained, just before Ray fought Floyd Mayweather Sr. in August 1978, I received a letter from Ray's attorney, Mike Trainer, which read, in part, I am concerned by the lack of time and effort you've put into Sugar Ray. As the second highest paid person in the organisation, we all expected more. To date, your involvement has consisted of arriving approximately two days before a fight, meeting with the press and working Ray's corner at fight time. More was expected of you. We must adjust your compensation so that it is more in line with your duties. I particularly liked the sincerely at the bottom. It took Angelo a month to reply to Trainer's insulting letter and he said, I nicely pointed out to him that I believed I was doing a great job with Ray and that my value was not to be dictated by other people's opinions but by the fact that Ray was unbeaten and coming along, growing with every fight. Furthermore, I expected to be paid what I had been promised in the contract. Trainer's reply was laughable. His letter stated, Unfortunately, Ray Leonard's win-loss record is not the only measure of your performance. So for the next year plus, the contract dispute continued to simmer. So he hired a lawyer, Angelo, to communicate with Trainer, But Trainer wouldn't ever answer his lawyer's calls or letters. This was not going to get sorted amicably. Angelo recalled the moment that the whole thing finally came to a head. And it was before Ray's fight against Johnny Gant. And he said, I was in a dressing room with Ray, Yanks Morton, Ollie Dunlop, Dave Jacobs, J.D. Brown and the entire Leonard team, minus Mike Trainer. Then Trainer walked in, sucking all the air out of the room, holding a yellow piece of paper. He came to me and said, Ray doesn't want any long contracts. I looked at him, looked at the paper and said nothing. He almost crammed the paper, the piece of paper down my throat, bullying me where persuasion would not work and told me, just sign it. It's okay, sign it, and you're out of here. The whole thing was uncomfortable for Angelo and for those in the dressing room. He remembered that while everyone stood around shuffling their feet and clearing their throats under compulsion, I did the only thing I could. I signed the damn paper. Almost immediately after I signed a piece of yellow paper, Ray came over and said, it will be all right. Then he gave me a, you're the greatest hug. One he held on so long, I was afraid rumours about the two of us would start. I could feel a circle of sadness in his hug, as if he knew he could have stood up for me, but didn't. 
I have always wondered why he didn't step forward and say something, just as Muhammad Ali had done to promote a Don King when he told King to leave Angie alone. Instead, Ray chose to second train his actions. In 2007, Angelo wrote, As I look back, I wish Ray had said something, anything, and stood up for me. I have always liked him and always will, but that I'll never understand. A few months after my confrontation with Trainer, the situation lightened up. I had an all-new two-year contract, albeit one with a cap on my future earnings, and Ray, as a way of reaching out to me, came down to Miami to visit Helen and me. When he returned home, he sent me the following note. Hello, buddies. Just a few lines to say things are going well, and I am very happy to say that not only have I found the world's greatest manager and wife, but two dynamite friends. Love ya. Although that note from Ray helped with his strange relationship with Angelo, it was clear that he did side with Mike Trainer, especially when he said this of Dundee in his book. Angelo was my official trainer, but he didn't train me the way people thought. I'd been trained already by Pepe Correa, Dave Jacobs and Yanks Morton. I used to laugh at the stories in the paper that gave credit to Angelo for swooping in a week or two before every fight with the magical formula to get me ready. I mean no disrespect to him, but if I did not have a strategy by that point, I wasn't going to find one in a few days. His true value was in the corner during the battle and as a matchmaker. In those roles, there was no one else who could have served me any better. Well, back to his career though, and the matchmaking part was absolutely vital when Ray got to his 18th fight. There was talk of him meeting Tommy Hearns again, but Angelo again put a stop to those discussions. Yeah, Angelo said up to this point, though his first 20 fights, I had scheduled each of Ray's fights by design, each when he was ready, and the time was right, but I didn't think the timing was right for a fight with Tommy. Not now, in a way. Talking with Emmanuel Stewart, Hearns' manager, I told him it's too early. Wait till the time is right. Wait till it builds up. Why now for a little bit of money when later Moncho Dinero? But I knew that somewhere down the line it would happen. So by the end of 1979, Ray had a record of 25 and 0 and was now in line for a shot at the WBC World Weight title and the ring as well against the brilliant Wilfred Benitez. Angelo said that by this point, Ray had answered my questions. He had matured physically, adding some weight, so that he was now a solid 146 pounds. And mentally, he had matured even faster, absorbing everything I tried to teach him. A little bit of Carmen Basilio, a touch of Ali, a shade of Willie Pastrano, and something of Ralph Dupas. And yet he was an original. He had his own style, a great change of pace and tremendous speed. The night before Ray got a call from Ali, so the night before his fight against Benitez, and Ali said, don't do any showboating, he warned. The judges won't like it. Now, we have described this fight with Wilfred Benitez and Ray Leonard's career profiles. Angelo described it this way. He said, from a technical standpoint, there was more done in this fight than I had seen done for a long time you saw two smart scientific fighters two champions in the ring at the same time they brought the best out of each other in front of a capacity crowd of 4600 sugar ray leonard managed to dethrone the youngest ever champion with six seconds to spare in the 15th round another world champion for angelo dundee Ray made his first successful defence of the WBC title against Davy Boy Green, knocking out his challenger with a punch he called perhaps the most beautiful punch he ever threw. However, the fight was not the main talking point. It was an incident that happened after the bout involving Angelo Dundee, who said, All I remember was that I was walking between two security guards with nobody in front of me on my way to the press conference one moment, and the next, I was lying on the floor face down, my glasses knocked off, totally discombobulated. What happened? I asked myself through my haze. All I could figure out through the fog was that someone had code-cocked me with a sucker punch from behind. 
as I was lifted off the ground by co-trainer Dave Jacobs and carried to a nearby room, two policemen came up and asked me if I wanted to lock him up. Him? Who the hell was him? In my vagueness, all I could come up with was that they wanted to lock up a half set of hand towels. As I lay there in a muddled state trying my damnness to make some sense out of the bizarre episode, I became aware of the familiar voices of those in the Leonard camp. From the fragments of discussions I could make out, it seems that an assistant trainer named Pepe Correa had become upset at something or other I had either said or done and cowardly swatted me in the back of the head. To this day, I still don't know what it was all about. Just a wannabe trainer who had trained Ray back in his amateur days and was now jealous of my position in camp? What could have compelled him to pull a lily-livered act like that? Well, it was apparently and rumoured that Angelo told him to move out of the way or move out of the way of the aisle, so Pepe punched him from behind, knocking him to the floor. Although Pepe obviously came back and says that Angelo told him to get out of the way and use the N-word. Well, Angelo had still he had no idea, as he said, what it was all about and only said his son, Jimmy, and a few of his mates went looking for Pepe later that evening, but they couldn't find him. It was also rumoured that it was finally resolved and apparently the mob were called in to uh, iron out the differences. Look, believe that or not, I doubt it very much, but it's up to you. There was a certain Roberto Duran to now think about as he was now installed as the mandatory WBC, moving up from lightweight. Again, as with a lot of these fights and fighters, we have, or we did an early legendary night tell of Duran and Leonard. So we want to send you in that direction for more details on the fight. But we have got some great details and some stories already in this episode from Angelo's perspective. And his assessment of Duran as well was his style was that of an assassin, constantly moving forward and employing three weapons, his left hand, his right and his head. He attacked with the singular desire to destroy his adversary, sometimes going into a left-handed stance, all the better to get inside. And with his teeth biting into his mouthpiece in a half-sneer, half-smile, he buried his head into his opponent's chest and took him apart with body shots. This was the first fight out of uh, between the four kings. So the four kings, obviously, Leonard, Durant, Hearns and Hagler. And it didn't dis- disappoint. It was the puncher versus the boxer. And Angelo had devised a plan. And this is what he recalled. He said, Deconstructing the films of Durant's fights, you could see that he was a heel-to-toe guy. He took two steps to get to you. So the idea was not to give him those two steps not to move too far away because the more distance you gave Duran the more effective he was Angelo explained what you can't do in progression is run it because then he picks up momentum so my guy wasn't going to run from him however Duran had done a number on Leonard and it all started when Angelo his wife Helen Ray's wife Juanita were having dinner the night before Roberto wandered in with his entourage and attacked him verbally. Ray, who was usually as cool as a cucumber, wanted to fight him there and then, and he had gotten into Ray's head. The psychological warfare continued at the weigh-in when Roberto shouted at Juanita, after fight, you and me, and then turned back to Ray and in Spanish screamed, I'm going to screw your wife, she's a puta. Angelo said that he followed up his taunt with a couple of crude pelvic thrusts in her direction. That did it. He had pushed Ray's hot button. Ray went berserk, and he had to forcibly be held back as he tried to get to Duran. Ray was pissed, and he told the press, I'm going to fight him flat-footed. Hearing that, Ray Arcel told his fighter, You've won that title right there. Amongst all this drama, and trying to prepare Ray for his biggest fight, Muhammad Ali shows up and Angelo explained why when he says here comes Muhammad hardly looking that handsome bright eyed beaming faced youngster of yesterday who used to say look at me I'm so pretty not a mark on my face his once magnificent shape had gone to pot over a disappearing belt line his once powerful voice was muffled his hair was greying 
he bore all the vestiges of middle age. During those intervening months, he had toured the world, doing star turns, cashing in on his brand name by appearing here, there and everywhere. Angelo continued that still that old fire burned within, believing that he had one more good fight left in him and one more chance to stand there basking in the glow and hearing his fans chant Ali one last time and no doubt also seduced by the chance to make history by winning the heavyweight title a fourth time along with, of course, an $8 million guarantee for such a fistic first. He now wanted to fight the current heavyweight champ, Larry Holmes, and he wanted me to be in his corner again. Angelo Nett didn't say whether he actually accepted there and then, but he would. However, he had uh, other more important matters at this time, like trying to get his fighter ready for a world title defence against the formidable Roberto Durant. Now, Leonard did not stick to the game plan. He didn't fight to his strengths. Instead, he fought to Durant's and lost a close decision and his world title. Angelo said it had been as exciting and close a fight as boxing had seen in years. It really was a great fight. And Angelo wasn't sure what Ray would do with his defeat. Would he retire or would he return? Would he come back and prevail? He actually initially retired. He went into a bit of a depression. But went back on his word and qu- very quickly and demanded the rematch immediately. Angelo knew right there and then that he had another exceptional fire on his hands. But first decided to join Ali in the corner for this return fight against Larry Holmes. And this is what he recalled. So he recalled the moment he joined Mohammed at Deer Lake for the final stages of his training for this Holmes fight. He said, I barely recognised him. He had lost more than 30 pounds. His voice was back in full throttle though and his hair was now black. Courtesy, he said, of a little black hair rinse. He actually looked terrific. Angelo continued and said, He told me that when he saw me up in Montreal, my thyroid glands were acting up. But he said, I took two pills a day for a month and it's all cleared up now. Those two pills a day he referred to were a thyroid medicine, Thyrola, prescribed by Herbert Mohammed's personal physician. His great looking physical condition was like something that looked good in a store window. But when you got it home, it was nothing like what you thought it would be. He had nothing, no reserves, no strength, no fatty tissue to burn up. And you knew it was more than just Father Time taking a toll on his 38-year-old body. It was those damn pills which help you lose weight but take your strength away. Their effect, in the words of Dr. Ferdi Pacheo, was like burning the tyres off a race car and telling the driver to race without wheels. Ali was hoping to become a four-time world heavyweight champion, but he was well past his best and should never have been in the ring. Angelo described the situation afterwards, he said, The ninth, when referee Richard Green came over to our corner to ask whether Ali wanted to continue, not wanting to suffer the humiliation of being stopped on his stool, the bone-weary Ali, who had given the boxing world 539 rounds, decided on yet another one, nodding his head yes to my question of, do you want to do it? I told him, if you don't start throwing punches in this round, I'm going to stop this fight. The fight should have been stopped there and then, but it continued, and as Angelo recalled, once again referee Green hurried over to the corner, concerned about Ali's inability to defend himself. I knew that Ali was looking for someone to save him since he couldn't do it himself, and I wig-wagged my hands to say it was over. However, that wasn't the end of this troubling fight. Angelo remembered all of a sudden I felt someone tugging at my sweater. It was Bundini refusing to believe the fight was over, pushing and pulling me, pleading for one more round. I couldn't help myself, but I had to scream at Bundini, who was in tears. Take your goddamn hands off of me. He can't take any more. He's defenceless. Get the hell away from me. I'm the boss here. It's over. I knew I was right, and so too did Mohammed, who through swollen lips muttered, thank you. So Larry Holmes won every single round, pretty much every round, every second in a one-sided beating. 
After the fight, Larry gave an emotional post-fight interview with tears in his eyes. When asked why he was crying, he said that he was he respected Ali a whole lot and he fought one of the baddest heavyweights in the world today and you cannot take credit from him. Larry visited his former sparring partner and friend in the changing room following his comprehensive victory and said, Man, you're a great man. I love you, man. And Ali replied, Well, if you love me, why you kick my ass? As Larry left the room, he could hear Ali shouting, I'll be back. I want Holmes. Give me Holmes. I want a rematch. In that typical Ali fashion. But he was nowhere near the old Ali. So a month later, in November 1980, Angelo was now devising a plan for Ray Leonard to defeat Duran. And he said, this time he, as in Ray, would employ a new, an all-new strategy, one as far removed from that failed in the first fight as New Orleans, the site of the second fight, was from Montreal. This time, Ray knew how to solve the puzzle that only one of Duran's 72 previous opponents, Esteban Jesus, had ever mastered. He knew how to beat Duran. Ray would box in the middle of the ring, where his hand and foot speed would give him the advantage and enable him to offset Duran's attacking dog style. The game plan was described by Angelo when he said, to achieve that victory, Ray would have to keep the guy turning, hit him with shots coming in, pivot off the ropes, spin out, slip the jab and move over. He couldn't go straight back, he had to push him off and when he spun, he had to stay there and nail him. And that's precisely what he did. Leonard outboxed Duran like he was an average fighter. Yes, he struggled with the weight after heavy partying in between the two bouts and yes, Ray was adamant on the fight being staged as quick as possible but that night in New Orleans, he looked every bit the special fighter. Duran, of course, quit. No mass, they said, but Leonard was the one who got the final laugh after the fight. Angelo was shocked at what he had seen. He said, I couldn't believe my eyes. What in the name of the Marquess of Queensbury was going on? One minute, Duran was charging in. The next, he was walking away, waving his arm, shaking his head. It was incredible. The fight was over. Sugar Ray Leonard had won the strangest victory I had ever seen. Leonard made two successful defences of his title before the showdown was negotiated with Tommy the Hitman Hearns. Angelo studied Hearns throughout his career knowing that one day he would cross paths with Leonard. So as he put it, I just had to devise a strategy to offset that power. A strategy that would have my guy play checkers with Tommy and keep him one move ahead of by putting moves on Hearns he'd never seen before. Looking at films of Tommy's fights, it was evident he was at his most dangerous at long range. So his plan was this. He always started his offence with the same feint. And when he did, Ray would be prepared to move inside and where the balance of power was all Ray's being better coordinated and able to get off quicker, especially with his left hook. Now, while Tommy could hit solidly from the outside, he was always off balance and flat-footed when he missed and could be hit. His defence was not the greatest. He always fought off balance, even having trouble skipping rope and hitting the speed bag. I fully believed that Ray could use that lack of balance to get inside and outmanoeuvre him. Put it all together, and I not only thought Ray would make the hitman, the hitty man, but that Ray would knock out the knockout puncher. And because Ray could take a hell of a punch, I didn't give Tommy much chance of knocking out Ray. So the opening five rounds was a demonstration of the beautiful art of boxing, uh, two completely different styles that cancelled each other out. This, of course, was to the displeasure of some of the crowd you can actually hear booing at times when you watch the fight back. Angelo and many others felt that Hearns was winning the fight, but then the fight turned in Leonard's favour after about the sixth round. Now, it looked like Ray was was actually going to stop Hearns in the eighth, but then Hearns got his second wind and the roles reversed again. So at the end of the twelfth, Angelo needed to get Ray to turn it up a notch. 
So he told him, you got nine minutes. You're blowing it some. You've got to pick up your tempo. Don't fight at his tempo. If you don't pick up your tempo, you're going to blow it. Granted, it wasn't a battle cry that would wake the echoes, but it paid immediate dividends as Ray, knowing it was all or nothing, leaped off his stall as if it were incandescent and raced out to do battle. In the 13th, Ray landed a right that shook Hearns to his toes. Sensing a chance for the kill, he pounded, slashing and shoving. He half punched and half pushed Hearns through the ropes onto the ring apron, which referee Davy Pearl ruled to be a push rather than a knockdown. But moments later, Leonard clearly knocked Thomas Hearns through the ropes and Davy Pearl counted to nine and was waving Sugar Ray Leonard to resume the brawl when the bell rang. When the 14th round started, Leonard was trailing on all three judges' scorecards, so he did what he had to do, as what a great fighter would do. He knocked out another great fighter and won the showdown. Angelo reflected at that very moment on all the bullshit Mike Trainer had given him. He said, As I stood there watching all the well-wishers jump into the ring to share in Ray's victory celebration, I thought to myself that for someone who had been told he had no credibility and that he hadn't been doing his job, I must have been doing something right. However, many have actually questioned why he was in the corner for Muhammad Ali versus Trevor Burbeck and why he didn't stop that fight from happening just three months after Leonard beat Hearns. But the simplest explanation might be the most honest from Angelo himself when he says, Muhammad fought again because he wanted to. I've heard all sorts of reasons. He wanted the money, there was this and that. Some people say he fought as long as he did because he felt cheated by the years he wasn't allowed to fight. But I'll tell you something, Muhammad was never happy outside the ring. He loved boxing, the gym, the competition. It was in his blood and win or lose, he loved it till the end. Angelo did admit as well that he continued to work with Ali even when he knew he was having problems with his health. Quite simply because if he wasn't in the corner, then some other guy would have been anyway. Someone who would have been in there who wouldn't have had his best interests at heart like he had. And he described his time with Varley like this. I can't do better than quote the great poet Maya Angelou, who wrote of Ali, his impact recognises no continent, no language, no colour, no ocean. Muhammad Ali belongs to all of us. And with Ali now rightfully retired, a few months later, so was Sugar Ray Leonard. Um, he made actually one defence of his world away titles and also had to retire due to a detached retina. But after two years out of the ring, Leonard actually called Angelo. Uh, he said he was coming back and Angelo picked ha uh, Kevin Howard, who almost embarrassed Leonard, knocking him down in the fourth round. That was a warning sign for Ray, as Angelo recalled. Although Ray would come back to stop Howard in the ninth, Within seconds of returning to his dressing room, he announced, it's just not there and I'll retire for good. So a year later, and Angelo was in the corner of Wilfredo Gomez against Rocky Lockeridge on May the 19th, 1985. And he was back to his old tricks. This is what he recalled. He said, by the 10th round, Gomez was completely gassed. His condition described as deplorable by my old friend, uh, Mario Rivera. It was so bad that I even thought about stopping the fight. But the stamina challenge Gomez pleaded with me to let him continue. And with Lockeridge now dancing around the ring, I thought maybe, just maybe, we had a chance. Especially if I could somehow buy him more time to gain his second or third or fourth wind. Angelo explained how he did it and he said, there had to be something I could do in this crisis. So, to gain time, I untied his shoelaces between rounds every round and each time I would call it to the ref's attention and he would give me a couple of extra seconds each time to retie the laces I had untied only a few seconds before. Naturally, being fumble-fingered, I took as much time as possible to retie them, even double-knotting them to give Wilfredo a couple of seconds of extra rest every time. And wouldn't you know it, 
double knotted or not, those shoelaces would come undone at the end of every round, and, out of necessity, I would have to retie them again. With those few seconds of precious rest between rounds, Gomez was able to suck it up and pull out a close 15-round decision without a tie. A year later, after Marvin Hagler fought John the Beast Mugabe, Angelo received a call from Ray Leonard telling me he had to do it, that he had that itch again. He wanted to fight Hagler, and I said, Amen to that. Angelo and Ray went to work. Angelo said, Usually all I need is three weeks in camp. Hey, I'm no sweat wiper. My job is to put myself into the body of my fighter in order to study his opponent and figure out how he's going to offset that guy, how he's going to beat the sucker. That means sitting at home for hours, going out of my mind, analysing and reanalyzing tapes, breaking them down frame by frame and studying the son of an my fighter is going to be fighting until I come up with that slap to the head eureka moment that tells me I found a way to win. Then I build a better mousetrap to do it. He set about his work and figured a few chinks in the armour. Yeah, he figured that Marvin was what I called a two-stepper, a hopper who had a sort of Lawrence Welker one and two-step cadence. He took a step or two before throwing a punch. And once thrown off his rhythm, he would be a sucker for the right-hand counter. Moreover, when he threw a double jab, he slid to his right. So Ray would have to slide to his right, so not to be there for Hagler to hit. Now, there were other things, two little things that didn't show up on film, but I thought would play an important role in the fight. One such thing was the so-called rust factor. Now, while most of the writers were busy filling space, writing that Ray hadn't fought in almost three years, and only once in five, very few, if any, mentioned Marvin's having fought only once in two years, and that in a less than memorable fight against John Mugabe, his once marvellous skills showed signs of erosion. He also noticed Marvin's overconfidence. Just to get Ray into the ring, Marvin had readily agreed to all of Ray's contractual demands. Ray wanted a 12-round or a 15-round fight to ensure that he wouldn't get fatigued. He also preferred lighter gloves for speed, and he wanted a 20-foot ring, all the better to manoeuvre him. It made no difference to Marvin, who agreed to all of Ray's requests, and Hagler probably thought he wouldn't need 12 rounds anyway, because if we're going to knock him out. Also, Marvin and his promoter were already looking past Ray to another fight against the welterweight champion at the time, Donald Curry. Then, Leonard trained like a beast, fighting real fights without head guards, fighting different sparring partners, and Angelo ex explained the importance of this. He said, Training is the most important part of boxing. It's the laboratory where a fighter's skills and styles are developed. He continued and said, It's not like a music teacher merely sitting a new pupil down at the piano and instructing that pupil to plunk away at the keys to his or her heart's content. It's more, much more. It's polishing a fighter's assets and filling rough edges, teaching a fighter to develop a style to fit his natural abilities and to correct his faults in the execution, and then to repeat it over and over again until it becomes instinctive. That's what Leonard did before the Hagler fight to get himself in a position where he could do the unthinkable and beat the formidable Hagler. Angelo came up with a strategy and one of the first things he saw Ray try to do was get out of a clinch by moving to his right. No, 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 I hollered. Go to the left. Ray didn't seem to understand saying, but I'll be going into his left hand thinking Hagler's left was his power hand. Yeah, I answered, but his strength is in the right because he's a converted right-handed fighter. Now that I had Ray's attention, I told him, when this guy leans on you, make sure you not only slide to your right side, but always lean on his right shoulder, not his left. Ray had also flirted with the idea of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Marvin to attack him. I had to put a stop to that nonsense. I hollered at him, what, are you nuts? His game plan was to move, 
then move some more. Not get into a battle with Marvin. Moreover, I told him to break up Marvin's rhythm. When he took his one-two step of his preparatory to throw in a punch, pop him, then get the hell out of there. Ray listened. Najlu said, he said, You see, he was different than Mohammed. With Mohammed, I would have to go around the, the mulberry bush, uh, make him think he was the one who came up with the idea. But Ray was different. He listened, especially after one of his sparring partners, Quincy Taylor, had put him on his duff while he was going toe-to-toe with him, preparing to take on Marvin, in, as he originally planned, a toe-to-toe battle. Now he started implementing the fight plan I laid out for him in every sparring session, working against the grain to negate his left-handed sparring partners right without concentrating on their left. And when we watched films of Hagler's fights looking for flaws, it was like Max Smelling, or like when Max Smelling was looking at films of Joe Lewis before their first fight and saying, I see something, as we continued to pick out Hagler's fault lines. Despite his inactivity, Ray was now brimming with confidence, looking and sounding like a man who knew all the head waiters in all the best places in town and knew he could get a table anytime he wanted. His table was now set for Marvellous Marvin Hagler. Now we've done, again, done a towel on Leonard Hagler. So check that episode out. So we won't go through the fight. What we will say is that many have been torn on this one. Even me and you, Sean, are split on this. I think Hagler just got it. And Sean, you think Leonard. That it was a difficult fight to score. It's what you prefer. And it probably changes every time you watch it. Angelo, well, he felt that Ray had dominated the action fought his fight and imposed his will on Hagler, so deserved the verdict, which he got. He won the middleweight title as well. And it was also Angelo Dundee's last fight with Sugar Ray Leonard, who went on to other stuff, or as we know, a few other fights, but he left Angelo. And Angelo, ironically, went on to team up with George Foreman, who had made a comeback into boxing. And he actually their team up actually started in 1991, in his heavyweight title fight against Evander Holyfield, which unfortunately he lost. But Angelo sees something in him and he stuck with him. What had happened here is they'd actually bumped into each other at an airport and Angelo recalled, George said to me, I've always wanted you to work with me. Will you? What else could I do but answer? Yes. Then came the big night, Foreman, and chance to win the heavyweight title in 1994 against the then undefeated Michael Mora. Foreman wore the same red trunks that he had worn in Zaire and in his corner was Angelo Dundee. What an incredible turn of events. Now we have gone through the Foreman-Mora fight on our Legendary Nights episode but let's recall that finish. Angelo had actually told Foreman just before he sent him out for the 10th round that it was going to take a knockout to win and that time had come. With Dundee's words ringing true, Foreman stepped out for the 10th and recalled I thought of Muhammad Ali in Africa and I knew what it felt when he got in the ring and everyone was cheering for him. I could hurt him, but the crowd just kept him on his feet. Now for the first time in my life, I was feeling the same thing. George Foreman reminisced on that famous 10th round. He said, the first punch I hit him with was a straight right. It was just a little too high. He didn't move out of the way because he was kind of stunned. I expected him to fall, but he didn't. I said right then, I was going to lower it just a little bit. That was the moment he landed that big right hand. Down goes Mora on a right hand. An unbelievably close in right hand shot, screamed Jim Lampley. At the count of ten, George must have felt some release, freed of the ghost that had haunted him for two decades. His prayers answered, he fell to his knees to give prayer of thanks, simply saying, Thank you, Jesus. And this is where we come to the end of the road, really. I think this is that's a great point and a great one to finish it with with Angelo Dundee. Um, In 1998, after decades, he actually did reunite with Arlen. They did see each other every now and then, but he reunited with him where they appeared alongside each other in a sentimental Super Bowl commercial. And in November 2008, he was actually hired as a special consultant for Oscar De La Hoya for his fight against Manny Pacquiao. Again, check out De La Hoya's career profile. 
we do actually mention this brief moment they they had together. Now, throughout his career, Dundee was widely respected as a decent, honourable man in an often corrupt sport. Perhaps the greatest tribute to Angelo was paid by Harold Cassell, who said, If I had a son who wanted to be a fighter, I couldn't talk him out of it. The only man I would let train him is Angelo Dundee. Now, Angelo did sadly pass away in his sleep at the senior resident apartment at the age of 90 on February the 1st, 2012 in Tampa Bay. A funeral was held on February the 10th, 2012 at the Countryside Christian Center in Clearwater, Florida, attended by a crowd of several hundred mourners, among them, of course, Muhammad Ali and I'm sure loads of his other fighters. Angelo's body was buried at Silver Abbey Memorial Park Cemetery in Florida. But we're going to end it with a few words. And, a, and there's one here that we haven't gone through, so we thought we'll end it as we, we don't want to end it on a sad note as such. But it was asked about regrets. He said, I have a few. Uh, his biggest heartbreak came in 1963, a double heartbreak, really. Uh, this is why we didn't go into this fight earlier. But Luis Rodriguez, my fighter, had been promised his big story in Sports Illustrated after his victory over Emil Griffith for the welterweight title. But Lewis had fought in the co-feature that night at Dodger Stadium on the same card headed by Davy Moore, who was defending his featherweight title against another of my fighters, Sugar Ramos. In a rock'em sock'em fight, with each fighter giving as much as they got, Ramos knocked out Moore in the 10th round. Moore's head whiplashing off the bottom rope and then bouncing on the floor. A few frightening moments... Moore finally regained consciousness, slowly opening his eyes and talking to those around him. Thinking everything was okay, I went back to visit Moore in his dressing room. We talked for a couple of minutes. He asking for a return bout and me saying, sure. Then he said, I'm tired. I'm going to lie down. He never woke up, dying two days later. Because of the tragedy, Sports Illustrated ditched the story on Rodriguez. My heart went out to Moore and his family, but I also felt a little for Lewis, who never got the recognition he deserved for being a great fighter. Now, before he passed in 2012, Angelo said, I'm still hustling. I have so many wonderful memories from the past 60 years. People I've known, places I've been to, breathtaking moments I've experienced. But there's still room for more. Much more. And with that quote, we end the career profile of Angelo Dundee. And we've got a few talking points, of course, with this episode. There's, there's been so many fantastic moments throughout the episode. One moment in particular that I wanted to bring up was a, a comment that was left on Twitter after part one was released. And that comment was aimed in the direction of Angelo knowingly carrying on with Muhammad Ali, knowing that he was riddled with Parkinson's, but yet still decided to carry on and in what some people might have felt like was sponging off the back of those last two fights of Muhammad Ali's career. Well, I think the quote that we read out earlier kind of takes that away a little bit, I think, for, for, for those comments. I think he openly says, if he didn't do it, who else would have done? Muhammad Ali was going to do it either way. So rather he be in the corner and look after him the best way he could than some hanger on, some opportunist who could come in and basically take a load of money and watch this guy get absolutely pummeled and beat down. Although he does get pummeled throughout the course of those two fights with Holmes and Burbeck. I mean, what a situation to be in. And, and I understand why people even now have that, that perception of, you know, why did they let him carry on? Well, it wasn't his decision. He would have just rather been with him than rather have just been sat watching this on TV. And you can kind of understand with such a special relationship that he had with Ali as to why he would want to be there either way. And the quote that we read out earlier, again, like I said, that pretty much gives you the answer to the question and to the comment that was made off the back of that first episode that we did on Angelo Dundee. Yeah, and I think it does. I mean, look, when Ali shows up in Montreal for when uh, Duran is obviously fighting Leonard and Angelo's out there, you know what it's like. I mean, Ali's saying, I'm doing it. I want you to be my corner. That's what he's saying. He's not saying, you know, I want you in my corner. And if you're not, I'm not going to do it. He's saying, I'm doing it. 
you know, the money was eight million. He's not going to turn it down, and he ends up getting pulverized by Holmes. But you know, even then, you you know, you had Drew Bandini. You know, people are going to sort of aim this at Angelo, but you're going to look at Drew Bandini. He would have probably been the lead man in the corner on that night if Angelo weren't there, and he was calling for another round. Who knows whether something even worse would have happened to to Ali right there and then? You don't know. And then obviously the, the situation with the Burbick fight. I've seen, there's a number of times he said, I've heard him say it, I've, I've read it, and he was like, I don't even want to talk about the fight. He can't even talk about the fight. He never wanted the fight. He didn't want Ali to go. But Ali was adamant. And like he said, why? The, the biggest question is, is not why did he let it happen? Ali was going to ha- he was gonna happen, wouldn't it, Sean? No matter what, no matter what Angelo did, no matter what the people that loved him and around him said to him, Ali was still going to do it. So you can't really blame Angelo. Angelo Dundee and, and and the other thing is he's right though it's true though Sean I mean if if someone's adamant he's, he's passed the medical test he's going to happen he's going to get the money what do you do the best thing to do is be there beside him and make sure nothing really fatally badly happens but you know the fact is as well he never retired Angelo he was always uh, a trainer he was always a- available he never really come out and said, I've retired. It just wasn't his thing. He just sort of continued. And if someone come to him and asked him for advice, obviously he was an old man. People probably didn't necessarily believe that he was useful in a corner anymore. Who knows? But he never actually retired. So that was quite funny that, you know, in 2007, he, he wrote the book. And um, the fact he still felt that there was still more. He's experienced a lot, but there was still more room. And who knows? He was even saying, you know, I, I may come back. So he never quite retired. And in the end, I mean, he lived to his 90 and died in 2012. But what a career. I mean, I know we're going to always look at him and think of, when you think of Dundee, you think of Ali. But you also think of Leonard and then some of them other great fighters. But I just love his perspective on, on on breaking down fighters and bringing up these these great ways and strategies of beating the fire. And, and more or less, they all went, every fighter did as he, as he requested, and obviously they had their own point of views. The only one that didn't was the rope hope, wasn't it? And that was it. For me, what I've learned mostly about this story and, and Angelo and Dundee as a trainer is I know why now everybody regards him as one of, if not the best trainer in boxing history. His ability to be able to sit and analyse a fighter and understand their weaknesses and understand how to overcome those weaknesses was an ability that not many fighters probably have today and trainers are able to learn today. And there's so many people that get into the sport today that are pretenders, that are fitness trainers that then convert to become boxing trainers, but without this level of knowledge that a boxing trainer has. And you think back to when his brother Chris Dundee started everything up all those years ago that we covered in part one and how Angelo was around soaking everything up like a sponge from all the great trainers before him. It was that, it was learning and taking bits of everybody's styles that he was able to mould his own style as a trainer and able to adapt his style as a trainer to be so, so successful with the fighters that he had. You know, we talked about the fighters of Louis Rodriguez and we talked about Carmen Basilio and we talked about Ralph Dupas and, of course, Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard. And, you know, he had little spells with other fighters throughout the course of his career. I mean, the George Foreman story as well, the fact that Angelo Dundee's in the corner when he wins the world title all those years later in his comeback. It's amazing, really, that it was Angelo Dundee was the man that helped mastermind that victory, that famous victory from George Foreman. So I've learned so much from this, from a from a technical perspective. You know, as a, as a boxing coach, you're able to pick so much up from Angelo's words and his experiences and his descriptions of fights and breaking down certain things in the gym of how a fighter does something. That's what's been most impressive for me and, and a real learning curve for me as an individual by covering this story and listening to Angelo's words and, and I can feel like I can hear him telling those words and repeating those words when when we go through these descriptions and it's 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 really sort of heartwarming to me as a as a fight fan that we've got somebody out there and somebody's knowledge out there that's going to be set in stone in history now that we can always go back and and listen to and go back and hear about and I hope that what we've done here is we've portrayed 
Angelo Dundee's story and his expertise and, and his truly brilliance of what he was throughout the course of these two parts in this career profile. Johnston, I'd like you to have a final word on Angelo. I've said quite a bit about what my takeaway is from doing this episode and this two-parter on him, but what what is yours? I, I love the um, descriptions and the, the little tricks of the trade he had in the corners, you know, whether it be just putting certain things in in a in the referee's head and make him speed up a count where it's like he learnt from Ray Arcel while picking up his robe and it's like it's over, just pick up the count kind of thing and dealing with cuts from matchmaking to the prep talking in, in fighters and getting in their ears and some were different, some you had to rally cry, some you had to tell them that you know, you're not going to get that house that you want if you don't knock this guy out. He was able to find that balance with fighters. I love that. He was always a personal level. It wasn't just, here's my game plan. Now, I'm an attacking trainer. And if that doesn't fit in how you fight, then you can't work with me. He used to adapt and try to to work things out, you know. And the other, like, even dealing with Willie Pastrano with, his, with the craziness of messing about with women all the time and having to keep an eye on him, making sure he ain't, you know, the milk he was drinking was at alcohol in and he had to keep an eye on that. It was it, like the, the everything from any, anything you can think of, he knew it. It was like, it was like a, a dictionary of boxing. You know, anyone or an encyclopedia of boxing, anyone can go up to him and just ask him about, now what do I do if this happens or that happens? He'd just have an answer for it. And it, he, we think we've pretty much put everything in here, everything you can think of that Angelo wanted to point out to everyone uh, in, in his book and, and just when you hear him speak. But yeah, I mean, just it's loads of things that always stick with me now because of Angelo. And there was stuff, obviously, we knew. Um, but yeah, that, I just feel like uh, he was he lived and breathed the sport of boxing. And um, I mean, in them 50s, in the, in the, in the era of the 50s and having the situations with um, Mr. Gray, with Frankie Carbo, I mean... It, he, that was crazy. He, had, he basically couldn't, tr- couldn't train for a year or fight for a year in New York because of that. But he's been through so much. And I mean, we haven't even touched on the fact that he did work Pinklin Thomas, another heavyweight world champion. Go and listen to that episode, Pinklin and the Dark Side of Boxing, because there's a, it does link up with him for a little while. Just so many fighters, Sean, wouldn't there? It was it was impressive resume. I mean, Jimmy Ellis, another one. I mean, they say, I think it's 15 or 12 champions he had. Some of them, I believe were champions and then just retain their titles or won another version while they were with him. But the guy improved them all. I honestly think that there was a, there is not many trainers out there that can improve so many different fighters with different styles and different techniques. If you needed some sort of support and he liked something about you, he would help you and he would improve you. And that's what a trainer's there for. Yeah, it, it, you can't help but feel inspired and just admire Angelo Dundee. Absolutely. Well, he worked with 15, that's 15 boxing champions over the course of his career. Most notably, of course, Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, Jose Napolis as well, George Foreman, George Scott, Jimmy Ellis, Cameron Basilio, Luis Rodriguez, Willie Pastrano, Sean Mannion. There's, there's plenty of them out there. Very, very big name throughout the course of boxing history. You know, this was a guy that really for us is is right right up at the top there you know you've got an argument for who is the best boxing trainer of all time is Angelo Dundee the best boxing trainer of all time I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts on it remember we have done Ray Arcel previously we have done Custy Amato they're two of the others out there that we've covered before we haven't yet done someone like an Eddie Futch which we'll probably do next year for the next season we'd like to throw another trainer into it but doing this episode was fantastic and I've really thoroughly enjoyed it I hope you guys listening have also enjoyed this career profile if you have do please let us know at career underscore profiles on Twitter or you can get at us at BTR Boxing Podcast Network on Facebook, on Instagram. If you're watching slash listening on YouTube, drop a comment in the box below and let us know what you thought of this episode and any elements of the whole story of Angelo Dundee. If you haven't rated us yet on Apple and left us a review, 
please go and do that. You can now rate on Spotify and leave a comment on the episode after you've listened. Please also do that. And if you can do it on any of the other available podcasting apps that you use to listen to us on, please make sure you do it. When you see the post go on social media, make sure you like and share it or like and retweet it. It'd be really appreciated if you guys could do it, if you could add the clip to your Instagram story or your TikTok account, whichever you are on, when you hear this episode, please go and support us by doing that. I want to also say thank you to the patrons of the BTR Boxing Podcast Network. By supporting us, they're allowing us to get so much more literature, so much more information that we haven't already used before for episodes like Muhammad Ali's profile and Sugar Ray Leonard and we're able to add so much more into these episodes that you haven't already heard which is fantastic and without the support of people like the patrons of the network we wouldn't be able to do that because by becoming a member they're helping us financially to be able to do that but in return they've had this episode earlier than everybody else that's listening to it but they've also had it ad free with no interruptions during the course of the episode now if you want to become a patron of the network you can do so by checking us out at patreon.com forward slash btr boxing podcast you will get those benefits and you will get access to episodes that haven't been released to the public so please do go and check it out and see all of the available tiers and content that is there but that is it for this episode we really appreciate the support and we want to thank you for listening to the life and the career profile of Angelo Dundee.